Welcome to Personal Landscapes. I'm your host, Brian Murdoch. You can find links for today's episode and other conversations on books about place at ryanmurdoch.com. In the waning decades of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, turn-of-the-century Vienna became a crucible of creativity. Many of the artistic movements that shaped Western thought in the 20th century began in this remarkable melting pot of cultures and influences. Austro-Germans, Ruthenians, Serbs, Croats, Bosnians, and Slovenians rubbed shoulders in the streets, and the coffeehouses buzzed with talk about the new, this new science of psychoanalysis and the work of Sigmund Freud. Sex was in the air, an air seething with repressed desires, and no artist captured this more vividly than Egon Schiele. Who was he? Where did he come from? What was he trying to achieve? Sophie Haydock imagined herself into this world by channeling the stories of three women that Sheila painted, his sister Gertrude, his muse Valley, his wife Edith, and his sister-in-law Adelaide. Did you ever stop to think about the model who posed for a painting and the life she led? Sophie's debut novel, The Flames, will change the way you look at art. She's the first novelist I've talked to on the podcast. My main interest is travel literature, but I always intended that personal landscapes be open-ended so I could speak to writers of fiction, historians, and others. If you're not familiar with the work of Sheila, I highly recommend looking at Sophie's Instagram feed to get a sense of his remarkable art as you listen to our conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Sophie Haydock, welcome to Personal Landscapes. So the the focus of this podcast is about is books about place and Setting is so important to your new novel, The Flames. Could you tell me about Turn of the Century Vienna? What made it such a crucible of creativity? Yeah. Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for inviting me on the podcast. Um, I'm really excited to talk about Fan de Siecle Vienna, uh, a time where so much was happening and so much was fermenting uh, beneath the surface. So I think Vienna at the turn of the 20th century was an incredibly atmospheric place. It was full of these kind of wonderful coffee shop discussions where people were, you know, eating Sachetor and talking about Freud and Mozart and all the kind of fantastic music, arts and culture that was happening at that time. Obviously, you had incredible artists such as Gustav Klimt, um, Kokoschka, Schiele emerging during this period. And The Habsburg Empire at that point had ruled for around 400 years, I believe. And they were they were kind of this dynasty that had just completely defined the Austro-Hungarian Empire for for centuries. And they were coming to the end of their power. um, But little did they know it. So it was a really atmospheric a uh, vibrant, dynamic place where so much was being brought to the fore in terms of literature, music, art, psychology, philosophy. Um, it must have been a wonderful place to be at that time, uh, especially for creative people. Well, it's it's amazing so just how much was happening there. Like just some of the things that I, I pulled up, the modernist movements in art and architecture, which eventually leads to the German Bauhaus. That's that on its own is significant. Atonal music, whatever that is, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. The philosophy Ludwig Wittgenstein was writing then, and as you said, Freud. I think Freud had published his. Um, it was in 1897. His treatise on, you know, the subconscious Oedipus complex that that had come out just at the turn, uh, the final few years of the 19th century. And they were kind of ideas that absolutely revolutionized uh, people's understanding of of how we think and our motivations. So that would have been incredibly significant. And Gustav Klimt founded the succession movement, I think, again, in around 1897. All these things were were happening. Much of them were a a rebuttal to the ways the ways that things had happened in the past. So there was a lot of you know, this sense of progress being made, uh, a beautiful new day on the horizon. And I think people really had optimism for the future at that point. And who who was Egon Schiele? How does he fit into all this at this this time? 
So yeah, Egon Schiele was born in 1890. He was born in a small town um, a few miles outside of Vienna. And he was born to a strict father who was a station master. Um, his father discouraged his son's passion for art, mainly because it affected his grades. And of course, there was no money or fame to be found in art. So his son should really concentrate on other pursuits. Um, and his father was very unwell. He was suffering from what we would now um, call syphilis. And perhaps at that time, they might not have been quite sure what was wrong with him, but he was going progressively mad. And this madness made him unpredictable. It made him strict. It made him violent. So Egon Schiele grew up in this very turbulent atmosphere And he grew up with uh, two sisters, one older, one younger. And he forged a very intimate and powerful bond with his younger sister, Gertrude. And it's fair to say we've seen from the evidence that Gertrude uh, was Egon Schiele's younger, uh, you know, first model. She posed for her brother. She went on to pose for him in the nude when she was um, a young woman. So we know that there was a huge amount of intimacy and trust there. So Egon Schiele grew up, he moved from this small kind of provincial town. He moved to Vienna as a young man when he got a place at art school. And I think it's fair to say that he was the youngest student that had ever been accepted at, at the art school. He became something of an enfant terrible of the art world. He was scandalous, he was provocative, he he really knew how to shock bourgeoisie and he delighted in doing so. Um, this landed him in a great amount of trouble. He found himself before a judge um, who had taken offence at the style of Egon Schiele's artwork and actually went on to burn a piece of the offending artwork in the courtroom. So Sheila t spent 24 days in prison, which was a very, I'd say, a shocking experience for the young man. He was only 21 years old at the time, and all that exuberance and rebelliousness probably took it took a little bit of a shine off his his surety. You know, he was very cocky, and then he landed himself in trouble, and he had to kind of reassess. But he was, um, in terms of his art, he was an expressionist artist, which means that he painted or he attempted to paint what was a sitter was feeling, what his model, um, what their emotions might have been. So rather than just concentrate on, you know, the reality of what was before him, he tried to replicate on paper or on canvas the emotion Um, that he saw and that might have been in a landscape or, or figuratively. He was hugely influenced by Gustav Klimt who was nearly 30 years older than Sheila and Sheila definitely saw him as something of a mentor and I think in fact that uh, the young artist Egon Sheila had been around 17 years old when he approached Gustav Klimt and asked him do I have talent And the older artist, you know, took a few moments and looked through Sheila's artwork and said, yes, you do. Talent, much too much. So this encouragement from one of Austria's greatest artists um, would have meant a great deal to a young Egon Sheila. And it only encouraged him to uh, sacrifice almost everyone in his orbit in his bid to become one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. I think it's not a spoiler to say that Egon Schiele died tragically young, just as his star was rising. And it's really fascinating to think what would have happened to him, uh, his artwork, and the women in his life if he had lived to be an old man like Picasso or Matisse, If he'd had another 50 years of life and creating art, I would love to have seen what he would have done. So what do you think Klimt saw in him at that time so early? Yeah, I mean, he must have seen a real um, vibrancy and a kind of precocious talent. Egon Schiele was making really spectacular artwork 
from being a teenager and certainly from the ages of you know 17 to 20 were some of his most prolific uh, years in which he created really groundbreaking arts of work so I'm sure if he took these uh, to Gustav Klimt's studio and asked the older artists to have a look at them I think Klimt would have seen a real urgency in the artwork and he would have seen shadows of his own style so I think Sheila did copy elements of Gustav Klimt's uh, Art Nouveau style. There was a kind of um, definitely a mimicry at play. But I also think Sheila then, when he grew more confident, he was able to take that in a completely new direction and almost surpass Gustav Klimt. I imagine Klimt would have seen something of himself in, in the young Sheila as well, right? Because he was shaking things up quite a bit. I mean, some of his paintings were received quite scandalously. And then what Sheila did was was beyond that by by a lot. You're absolutely right. I mean, people think of Gustav Klimt today and they think of these kind of really uh, nice paintings that get replicated a lot. And you see on postcards and mugs and, you know, pillowcases. And you think of the kiss, you know, which is sensual and erotic. And there's a huge amount of gold leaf and these kind of Art Nouveau motifs. Um, But you also forget that Gustav Klimt also was drawing uh, pictures of women masturbating. He was drawing um, some quite provocative artwork. And Klimt himself was father to at least 14 children. So he was no stranger to controversy. And um, I think that perhaps is the way things were back then. Artists did have a license to to get away with more in in the name of art than perhaps other men might have been allowed to. It's a very fine line between um, what's what's controversial and what is it's totally beyond the pale, right? So if somebody's as established as Gustav Klimt, he, he has a certain level of acceptance, whereas Sheila gets thrown in jail for essentially taking what Klimt was doing and going much further with it. Absolutely. And I think uh, Sheila certainly recognised the hypocrisy that was at play. He could see that uh, as a young, impoverished artist, he needed to make money. And the pictures, uh, uh, the paintings and the drawings that would sell most quickly and for the best price would certainly be the ones that were most provocative and erotic. So he knew that this was the case. He knew that there was an appetite uh, for this kind of artwork and yet everybody wanted to deny the impulses that were at play oh you know there's we don't want to see it we don't want it to be part of um the public you know awareness that this is that this is going on but certainly Sheila held a mirror up to this and said you know art is not it is not filth unless it is in the eye of the beholder you know, we should have more respect, I think, for for art, which is which is erotic and sensual, and that is something that he considered entirely natural and something that we all have very natural urges, and and this was something that should be celebrated rather than hidden away. The timing was really interesting as well, because sexuality was in the air in Vienna with with Freud's work, and he focusing so much on on the repressed urges of people, and and then Sheila comes along and puts it right in your face in a way that's graphic and powerful and moving as well. I, I want to get to uh, kind of a description of his art, but before that, um, where did you first encounter it? Do you remember? I I absolutely do remember. So I had been um, invited to an exhibition at the Courtauld Gallery in London. Um, by one of my friends who was visiting for the weekend she sent me a text message and I very nearly I very nearly made my excuses I thought oh well well, you know I've got a lot to do today maybe I'll maybe I'll give it a miss but something about this exhibition you know it made me think you know what I'd like to go and see these works by Egon Schiele and I thought I knew a bit about him when I entered the gallery Um, I'd heard of him I'd had a postcard of one of his portraits uh, taped to my wall at university so I'd looked at I'd looked at this artwork a lot and I'd looked at the woman in it but never really given it much more thought than that and it was only when I went into the exhibition at the Courtauld Gallery and was surrounded 
by all these incredible artworks uh, that, that something shifted for me. And the exhibition had been called The Radical Nude. So as you can imagine, um, you know, it wasn't for the faint hearted. There were, there were a huge number of, of paintings and drawings that were very explicit. And I remember looking around and just being really gobsmacked at, at the standard of the work and the how provocative they were and how accomplished. I remember looking at one drawing of a young woman and she it was very sensual. She had her arm raised up to her hair and she just looked beautiful. She was painted in the most adoring way. And it was only when I read the description and it said this, uh, the sitter is uh, Gertrude Sheila. You might think this was a wife, this was a lover perhaps, but no, it was the artist's little sister. That really struck me. So I was in the gallery kind of with all these questions uh, swirling in my mind about how Gertrude ended up in a position like that, posing for her older brother. And it was only at the end of the exhibition that I saw, you know, a biographical description on the wall that told me how old Egon Sheila had been when he died, um, which came as a complete shock because I realised that he'd made such a huge amount of artwork in such a short amount of time. And I found out then that he had died three days after his wife, Edith, who had been six months pregnant with their first child. And that was so poignant for me. And I kind of felt it a bit like a thunderbolt. I really knew at that moment that I wanted to find out more about Edith Harms and her relationship with this artist and what had led to her being in his path, the way that she had lived and the way that she had died. And it was only after I left the gallery, I went home and I, you know, you get onto Google and you very quickly discover uh, all these kind of intricacies and uh, questions relating to Sheila and the women who posed for him. And I think I knew instantly that I had a really great story on my hands. I didn't, you know, even if I didn't know how I was going to tell it. I knew that the bare bones of of these people's stories were just ripe with, you know, heartbreak, betrayal, tragedy, sex, scandal, you know, all these kind of tick words that you're thinking, yeah, this is a really uh, compelling and explosive story here. And I was just thinking, I don't just want to tell Edith's story. I want to tell the story of these four main women who posed for Egon Schiele and and give them the chance to paint a portrait of the artist, which I felt wasn't something that they'd had the opportunity to do before. It's amazing how his work sticks with you, right? Like I I vividly remember as well the first time I encountered it. It was uh, December 2015. I was in Vienna uh, over Christmas and there was an exhibit at the uh, Lower Belvedere um, it was called Klimt, Sheila, Kokoschka, and the Women. And I remember, we so we went through the entire Upper Belvedere and Lower Belvedere, and I vividly remember two things uh, about that that entire museum. Uh, one was a minor painting of a dog. Uh, it was just his head is visible, straining to get above the edge of a, the edge of a table, and and we see him staring transfixed at this plate of uh, of sausages. I, I've got a. I don't know if you can see that if I hold it up. I have a postcard of this. Oh. <laughs> so the title is uh, Caesar on the Rubicon. <laughs> it's just brilliant. <laughs> this dog is about to make a, a decision. He, you know, he, there's no turning back if he eats these sausages. So, so this, this, uh, this painting of this dog stuck in my head completely after that exhibit. And the other was obviously Sheila's paintings. And I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't get them out of my head. So when I saw your Instagram accounts, yeah. you know, I immediately followed that. So maybe um, you could, First, describe the paintings for us, for people who don't know his work. How would you portray them in words? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think uh, Sheila's work is very linear. He he often has his models set in quite blank backgrounds. So there will be 
posing in ways that look really uncomfortable or improbable because he will remove the chair or he will remove the elements of whatever the model is sitting on. So straight away, they're very compelling visually and the composition is usually highly unusual. You might have limbs that have been truncated, um, arms that kind of go off the edge of the paper. Um, often his his models might just be torsos, so you might just get the lower part of the body with the arms behind their back. They're very visually arresting. So I think straight away that you, you know, an, an Egon Schiller painting or drawing is unmistakable. You know straight away um, what you're dealing with. He has such a signature style. And I think what's also unusual about him is that he uses very bold and modern colours. So we see a huge amount of neon yellow or a very lurid green, or he might use purple in a skin tone. Um, this was must have been incredibly modern for an artist working more than 100 years ago. And he combines all of these things in a way that his artwork today feels incredibly it still feels incredibly relevant, I would say. And I think that's why it appeals so much to people on Instagram, because it doesn't feel like this fusty old artwork that dragged from 100 years ago into our present moment. It feels very dynamic and powerful. So I think people really connect with it on that level. Sheila also did a large number of landscapes. Um, he painted a fantastic number of self-portraits. I think he was very much obsessed with his own image. And again, he didn't flinch away from presenting himself that would have been quite unusual then. He really sexualized himself. He sexualized his own masculine form. And I think that was unusual at the time because it was only really women who got sexualized in that way in painting. So he did you know, he did really try and push the boundaries of gender and what we consider uh, stereotypical ideas of gender and also sexuality. There was a huge amount of desire in his paintings and they're very charged. But I also think that he, he uh, Sheila, managed to do something that other artists hadn't particularly done very well before, which is give his women in particular, a degree of autonomy and power, because often the women are looking back, they're making eye contact with the viewer, they're able to assert some of their own sexuality. And this is this is quite rare for, for artists who are making work 100 years ago. Another thing that strikes me about it too is that there's no background really. The figure of the model is really foregrounded and in a, in a way that's um, not confrontational, but... It's, it makes it impossible to look away or become distracted. Uh, I, came, uh, I came across a couple of descriptions. One was contrasting him with Klimt. It said, whereas Klimt suggests, Sheila confronts. Bodies balloon and twist, legs splay, gazes burn. Sheila wants to harness and amplify human vulnerability, not smooth it over. I thought that was really good. That's a really good point about vulnerability. He definitely didn't shy away from capturing the weaknesses, the the fears, the things that make us wake up in the middle of the night. You know, he managed to do a really good job at, at capturing those. And I'm sure that was down to his um, commitment as an expressionist artist. But yeah, I love, I love that. I love that line about vulnerabilities and how he pushed at that side of things. The, the paintings are very graphic, but it's, it's not lurid in the sense that that vulnerability really comes through and the humanness of it is, uh, it doesn't feel like an exploitation, which I think some of his critics would have, would have leveled at him, especially the judge that, um, that burned his painting. He wasn't exploiting anybody in the sense of what he was trying to depict, at least. I, I really agree with that. I think, I think his artworks could be hugely explicit and some of them have certainly still have the power to shock today. But I definitely agree that I think there was always a tenderness at the heart of whatever he did and whoever he was portraying. He also had access quite unusually, I think, to women who back then might have been described as fallen women, women who were pregnant, they weren't married. He was given access to these women by his friend uh, who was a gynecologist 
um, von Graf, I think, I believe. And he he gave Egon Schiele access to go in and paint these women who were probably in the later stages of pregnancy and weren't quite sure how their lives were going to play out. And the the paintings are just, you know, he captures women at, as you said, the most vulnerable point in their lives, but there isn't, it's not exploitative. It's not confrontational. He's not trying to dictate a narrative for these women. He is just painting them with a huge amount of openness and insight and, you know, a real tenderness in there. So I think that's really worth remembering with him. And he was a young man, you know, I think this obsession with sex and eroticness and sensuality, you know, he was a young man in his 20s while he was making the majority of his artwork. And I think, again, when he died, he was just starting to get the recognition that he'd been searching for all his life. And he was about to become a father. He was married. I think these things would have really changed him as an artist and we would have seen a very different direction in him. But as it happens, he got caught in time and he never got chance to develop as an artist beyond this kind of really raw explicitness. Uh, I think that makes him more interesting, you know, and, and more of a complex character for us, you know, to look at him with a hundred years of knowledge and we, we've made progress along the way, but I think the questions that are asked of his artwork are really interesting today. That's really astonishing that this was a hundred years ago. That's, as you said before, it feels so contemporary, his work. And I've read another interesting description of his, uh, his self-portraits. They talked about how he's almost manifesting a belief that we hold multiple selves and that you see that same sense of vulnerability in the way he, he, he painted himself. He will often pull really exaggerated facial expressions and capture these in his self-portrait. So he might be grimacing in one or he might be pulling his eye down and doing this really um, strange facial uh, facial contortion in another. And I think he was very comfortable with poking fun at himself and also being something of an actor, you know, taking on different roles dressing up, playing with this sense of identity, this self sense of self, all the things that you've brought out really um, nicely with that quote. But yes, he was definitely interested in the way in which we can live multiple lives and have multiple personalities and all of these things are changeable. Yeah, there's a really exploratory nature to it that was quite interesting. So what, what did his contemporaries think of him? I mean, apart from Clint, who saw his genius. Yeah, Klimt did see his genius. And I think that he was he was certainly seen as someone who was at the forefront of his generation. So he was often chosen for exhibitions. He exhibited in Munich and Berlin and many other places uh, around Europe at that time. And he was seen as something of a rebel. So he split from his year group at the art school before he finished his studies which was something that I'm sure would have gone down really badly with his family once again you know he's he's taken all these chances to get into art school and sacrifice so much and then he clashes with authority once again and he ends up um, rejecting the way that things have been done before far too formal far too conservative he wants to set the agenda and do something that he sees as much more radical. So I think he would have been seen by his uh, peers as someone who, who was arrogantly but successfully pushing boundaries. His sister Gertrude, his younger sister, who he had a very close relationship, did end up marrying his good friend Anton Peschka, who... You know, again, this was a, an interesting development that I discovered, you know, by reading the history of, of these characters. And, you know, Anton Peschka was um, an artist himself. Him and Sheila would have been friends from the Academy. And it's interesting that this kind of closeness between brother and sister and then who she went on to marry. Um, I did I did wonder in the book whether that would have provoked jealousy from Sheila or whether he would have felt happy that his sister had 
kind of remained in the fold, so to speak. So your your novel focuses uh, not on Sheila directly, but on the the four of the women he painted. And you raise an interesting question very early on. Your narrator in the present tense or the present time, Eva, says, I never stopped to imagine that these models had lives of their own. And I hadn't really thought about that before. Like we see a work of art and we're intrigued by the technique and the brush strokes and the use of perspective or lights or how color channels emotion. But how often do we consider the, the person being depicted or the setting in which the, the painting took place when well, they're just these anonymous models? I thought that was such an interesting way to tackle the story. Why did you, why did you decide to do it this way? I think it's really interesting that you picked that out from from um, the scenes with Ava. And I think that, that that thought probably goes back to the experience that I had with the postcard that I had taped to my wall at university. I'd looked at it several times, probably daily while I was doing my final year at Leeds University. And um, I remember being really moved by this portrait, but it wasn't until after I'd been to the exhibition at the Courtauld Gallery that I went back and I dug it out and I looked again and I saw the name Adele Harms. And so I realised at that point that this woman was not just any old model for Egon Schiele. This was his wife's sister. And she was posing for the artist in her underwear. She's got a really wistful look on her face, one that to me looks full of longing and I'd always I'd always wondered about her I think as I'd as I'd looked at it when I was a younger woman but I looked at it again as a writer and I realized that there were just so many questions that could be asked about Adele and her relationship um, with the man who was painting her and I tried to put myself in her shoes I tried to imagine how she must have felt whether she had any regrets or her own set of longings. And I think it's it was an interesting exercise for me because I know that I hadn't asked those questions. I hadn't stopped to wonder about who Adele, Adele was. And it had taken me a decade really to get around to asking those questions myself. And when I did, the answers were just so um, unexpected and so compelling. And I think on some level as well, Adele is perhaps my one of my favourite characters in the book just because she she's so full of flaws and we get to see her um, as an old woman, somebody who's lost, you know, both her sister and, you know, the man who painted her when she was a young woman. So it felt like there's such a story there with all of them. But, but returning to your question, I think it was my own experience of, of having looked into this woman's eyes in this portrait in this way and, and not having made that leap into, into wanting to know at that time who she was. That's the portrait you included in the book, right? That's the same as the postcard that you had? Yes, it's that one on the front. I don't know if you can see Adele posing with her with her kind of legs spread and her head on her knee in that position. And she just looks, she looks so beautiful and she looks so full of a kind of longing that it just raises so many wonderful questions. That's such a magnetic picture. I have the, the eyes gazing right out at you, but looking at you so directly and self-consciously really. That's absolutely the word. Yeah. She does seem she seems very confident in herself, in her skin. And I think I realized that when I put two and two together and realized that she was uh, the artist's sister-in-law and that it was her sister who was married to Egon Schiele, I then went and looked at the pictures of Edith. And Edith, in comparison to Adele, is so uncomfortable in front of the artist's gaze. You know, she stands in front of him in this fabulous painting, an oil painting that... Sheila made of her in 1915, just months after their uh, wedding day. And Edith just has this um, really uncomfortable look on her face. You can tell that she wants to be just about anywhere else um, other than standing in front of him. 
And again, I think this idea of the personality of these two women, these two sisters um, started to emerge, one who was very confident and, you know, was quite happy to take her clothes off and another who really didn't want to be in that position and perhaps would have, you know, was an unwilling, she found herself in this position simply because she married the artist and there would have been a huge expectation from him that she had to take up this role. Uh, So it was just fascinating to see through the paintings, through the evidence that he left us of the the dynamics that might have been at play there. You said uh, Adele was buried in the same grave as Sheila. Yeah, this was really fascinating information that I don't think had uh, been made public before, but I found that there was 50 years between them Um, Adele had died aged 78 and Egon Sheila had died aged 28 and I knew that Egon and Edith were buried in the same graveyard in the same grave almost they were buried next to each other but Adele for some reason and one that I haven't quite got to the bottom of yet but, but not for want of trying is buried in the same grave as her brother in law And again, this just raises so many interesting questions because I imagine she could have been buried above her sister, but no, she was buried above Egon. This really captured my imagination. And what's more, that there's nothing there to commemorate Adele. There's nothing to say when she was born, when she died. And this feels like a massive oversight. So it's something that I'd like to see rectified if there's any way of of having a proper memorial to her, um, some kind of small marker to say that she lived. I think that would be a really fitting tribute to her. So there's no stone or any notification of any kind on on the gravesite. How did you find out? Um, I think I went to, I went, I visited the graveyard when I made research trips to Vienna and I looked at the, um, you know, the plot and the information there. And it was it was then that I saw that this plot with Egon Sheila also included Adele Harms. And I wow. it was fascinating. Such an interesting connection, yeah. So what was the status of uh, an artist model at that time in Vienna? Was this something um, scandalous to do? Yes, I think I, I think it's fair to say it was seen as akin to prostitution. So for women um, at that time to to be in a position where they had to take their clothes off for money, this was seen as something that uh, respectable, well-bred women very rarely um, would want to or would have to do. So Sheila was a you know a young man, an impoverished artist. He would have approached you know girls about his age who he saw walking around Vienna he might have stopped in the Parc Chambron or he might have met them on the tram he could have been anywhere and he would approach them and say you know I can pay you a small amount and perhaps would you would you pose for me and more often than not I imagine they would have been happy for the invitation and it wouldn't have been a great deal of work and they would have got enough money to go off and get a meal or whatever. I, th- I thought it was notable too in the book that you said he always did pay his models, despite how impoverished he was. I mean, he he was barely eating at times and devoting all his energies to his art, but he still he still made the point of paying paying the people who posed for him, which was I thought yeah. was quite admirable. I think he did, and perhaps when he had when he developed very intimate relationships, um, it would be at that point when he was sharing their lives with somebody, whether that was Gertrude, his sister, or Valley who became a very significant model for a period of three or four years. Um, Perhaps then the payment would have been, you know, it would have been, oh, we're living together, we're eating together, we're supporting one another. Um, So things might have changed at that point. And that's certainly why these women would have appeared with such regularity in his artworks, just because he had the best access to them but also perhaps it worked the other way he you know he appreciated them so much that he wanted to share his life with them I think that's also responsible for some of the incredible intimacy that he's able to capture in his paintings because he was working with these same models over such a long time and obviously trust developed between them and it's a deepening relationship that you must not be able to have with somebody who just comes and poses once 
Yeah, that's absolutely right. So we know with Valley Nurtzel, for example, we know that she started posing for him a few months before she becomes really recognisable in his artwork. So at the beginning, she's quite anonymous. He just is using her body in a very, probably quite transactional way. You know, he's he's drawing her quickly, moving on, and perhaps she returns the next week and, you know, they get to know each other a bit better. But certainly during quite a short period of time, she becomes very recognisable and you start to see her features emerge um, with some with quite a lot of definition so that's something as their intimacy deepened and their relationship grew uh, she becomes a much greater presence in her artwork and that certainly would have led to the emotional intensity that we see there and you wrote in the book that she, he was introduced to valley through uh, gustav klimt was that was that right that's the rumor i mean i'm sure the scholars who would uh refute that. I'm sure that if we really trawled through the history books, it would be hard to find really hard factual evidence of it. But it's certainly the rumour. And it was one that was too good to pass up for fiction, just because Klimt was such a fantastic influence on Sheila. And I love this idea of of those two meeting in, in Klimt's studio in that way. I thought it was really... Um, a lovely detail and something that should be explored. I like the way you painted those, those first encounters as well in the book. Like they, Klimt says, Oh, can you pose for my, my friend? And she wasn't too impressed with them at the beginning. This, this bossy brash young talent. Oh yeah. It's just kind of, uh, we've seen this before and we'll, <laughs> we'll see many more like him, but that at some point she, she takes a look at what he's, what he's painting and realizes there's something more here. And a grudging kind of respect develops until, as you said, this this great intimacy uh, arises between them and they're living together often in the village where he's eventually arrested. So t- tell us more about Valley. Like, she's quite a compelling character, I thought. Yeah, Valley is, um, I think she's an incredible woman. She really does, she earns a huge amount of respect, I think, from from everybody who reads um, her side of the story. So Valley is rumoured to have met Egon Schiele in the studio of Gustav Klimt. And another part of the myth is certainly that she came from a less privileged background. You know, we're told that she didn't perhaps have a huge amount of education or that there wasn't much wealth in her family. So she would have been seen as a lower class uh, woman and Sheila, despite his poverty as a young man, still came from quite a respectable background, um, one in which education was really encouraged and he was expected to follow in his father's footsteps and go into a career in the railways. They came together and they were certainly um, very good for each other for a long time. And I think Valley would have helped Sheila a great deal with his artwork she would have posed for him she would have delivered his artwork to his patrons she would have organized his accounts and done all this kind of really fantastic admin that probably would have made his life much much easier and they left Vienna um, and went to a small town called Nulenbach Um, first of all they went to Chesney Krumlov which is the place where Egon Schiele's mother was born. And they spent this kind of very lovely summer there together and kind of skirted with scandal because he was this uh, provocative artist and they wouldn't have been married. So she would have been seen as this mistress figure, which would have angered the locals. So they, they skirted trouble there and managed to escape before it escalated. And then they left for... Nulenkbach, which is where Egon Schiele's uncle um, apparently had a summer house. So they ended up there and the trouble that had been hot on their heels caught up with them. Again, I think the locals were troubled by, by this kind of couple and the nature of Egon Schiele's artwork. And Schiele ended up in, in a cell, in a prison cell, and Valley absolutely stood by the artist through his darkest days. She was there for him all the time. She proved herself to be incredibly loyal at a time when pretty much everybody would have turned their back on him. She remained 
his closest confidant and somebody who um, he was he turned to in his hour of need. And I think it it says a huge amount that after that harrowing experience, Egon Schiele returned to Vienna, probably a changed man. His his priorities were certainly different. And it was at that point, I think, he realised that he needed to marry. And he needed to marry advantageously. He wanted to marry somebody of a higher social standing so that he could be the man that he had been born to be, which was, you know, quite quite well to do. He would have wanted the, you know, the social standing whilst also hoping to continue his dalliances with these models, including Valley. So, yeah, she's she's a really headstrong and determined and loyal woman. And I think it's a great credit to her how she she behaves throughout all of her encounter with Egon Sheila. And it's just sad that she made decisions when she split up from him her life went in a different path and yeah that that didn't end too well either <laughs> yeah she was such an interesting character it's very practically minded both in the business sense but just in making sure there was something to eat like she i can't see how he would have survived without so. <laughs> neither can i bread crusts and you know she really looked after him and uh found a way to to nurture him and nurture his talent. So I think he owes her a great deal. As he does to all of these women. I mean, what, so what, what would you see the role of um, Edith in terms of like, you, you said he, he married her for a certain uh, respectability at a time when he was upwardly mobile, but what did Edith and uh, Adele bring to him in terms of, you know, making, making possible what he did apart from modeling? Yeah, I think they, I think they certainly represented a different kind of future for Egon Schiele. And I think he knew that to become the man that he wanted to be in Viennese society, he had to take a step up. He had to marry well. He had to do the respectable thing and, you know, step into his adulthood um, in a way that, you know, was expected of young men in their mid twenties. I think there was an expectation in Vienna at that time that when you're young, you sow your wild oats and you have a great time. But then in your mid twenties, you kind of settle down. Um, so they certainly represented stability for him, perhaps. Um, and then the war came along and really upended everybody. So I think uh, the First World War was announced, and it would have been a terrible shock for everybody in Europe and in Vienna. The precariousness of that time probably accelerated this idea of marriage and having stability so Edith and Adele I believe were playful and I like to think that Egon and Edith did have a great love affair I know it's been presented in the history books as he married her only to take a step into this kind of respectable world but I really like to believe that he did fall in love with her and that he wanted to share his life with her in a way that would have been emotionally connected and not just a kind of calculation for him. She comes across as quite a sympathetic character as well, very likable. I mean, all of the, um, all four of these women are very compelling. I really like how you sketched out their lives and imagined their possibilities. Uh, so Valley becomes, after the breakup, she becomes a nurse, right? A Red Cross nurse and goes off. And so this would have been World War I. When she went off nursing? Yep, this was before she she joined the Red Cross. She went off to Dalmatia, which was um, which is now Croatia, and she uh, she yeah she helped soldiers. She nursed them back to health. She set broken bones. She would have really been doing a, a wonderful thing, helping helping in this way. And again, I think it's a testament to her character that this was her inclination and this is what she wanted to do at that time and she she died of typhoid i think it was right uh scarlet fever Scar- scarlet fever yeah, yeah, yeah she caught scarlet fever while she was in this role as a red red cross nurse um and she died very young and um again it's a great tragedy that that her life didn't have the chance to play out for another 50 years the the only two that made it into old age were Adele and Gertrude, and it's really sad to think that that these women all had such potential and that was snuffed out so early. 
Where is she buried? Uh, Vali is buried in Sinj, S-I-N-J. Uh, she was buried in an unmarked grave, uh, one that had been become completely dilapidated, and she had her grave restored a few years ago now, and she has the headstone and the recognition that she deserves. So that's a, that's a really encouraging thing to know. It's quite sobering to see how how easily lives were cut short at the time as well, right? With um, both Edith and, and Egon Schiele succumbing to the Spanish flu, days apart, foully dying of disease as well, diseases that are, are quite curable today. So really very sad. It really was. I think to write about a pandemic before we knew we had our own pandemic on the way was certainly... When you're when you're researching it, it's very different from living through it and understanding, you know. And even the one that we've experienced is very different from how it would have been a hundred years ago. But it's certainly an irony that I could never have imagined when I was writing those scenes that that we'd have our own one to contend with. So, why did you choose um, to incu- include a later time narrator in the form of Ava to tell the story? Yeah. So Ava is, I think she felt like a more modern uh somebody with a modern viewpoint who'd be able to see Egon Schiele with a historical perspective somebody who could be uh critical and inquisitive about his nudes and his attitude towards women and one who could also um help Adele with the redemption that she so clearly needed um so I really feel that it was fascinating for me that Adele lived to be 78 years old. And I was told um, from one of the Sheila scholars who I met in Tuln, which is the small town where Egon Sheila was born, that Adele had lived to be 78, but she had died almost penniless on the streets of, practically living on the streets of Vienna, that she had no children, no family, she had nothing to to call her own. And this, again, hugely captured my imagination because she, as a young woman, had had the whole world at her feet. She came from a good family. She was well-educated. She would have been fighting off suitors, I'm sure. And she really would have, you know, just had so much possibility in her future. So I was really transfixed with this idea of what must have gone wrong in her life for things to end so badly for her. And I was really fascinated to think about the regrets she might have had, whether she felt responsible in any way for her sister's death and her um, brother-in-law's death at such an early age, and how she might have felt as an old woman, thinking back to herself as a young woman, um, being painted by by this artist, and, and how that might have provoked a nostalgia and a a kind of summing up of her life, you know, who she used to be, how this would have impacted her in that way. It's very poignant how what an impact chance events have as well. Like the, she's someone who's came from quite a wealthy family or, or at least very well off, whose fortune was wiped out by the war in the same way that the others were cut short by common diseases that would be easily cured today. Just these these massive events that can totally blindside you and destroy a life. And the other thing I really liked about your presentation of, of Ava was the sense of here, here's somebody from the present time going to this gallery with this old lady expressing her opinions about the past based on how we see things today. And, and Adela says, no, it wasn't like that at all. You don't understand. It sort of touches on the, um, the current trend to judge the, the people of the past based on our, our present morality, rather than trying to understand how they may have felt about things and, and what they may have thought at that time to better understand them, you know, rather than project our views onto them. That was, that was a really nice touch, I thought. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that the world, especially in Vienna 100 years ago, was a very different place. And for us to try and import our ideas of equality and feminism and all the rest of it onto these people is probably a misguided thing to do. I don't think we should judge them or their actions, um, especially as it's it's on record that Adele and Gertrude in their later life, they were interviewed by Alessandra Camini and they certainly never felt like they were victims of Egon Schiele or that they'd been exploited or that they'd been pushed into doing things that they didn't want to do. 
they knew their own minds they were headstrong they they all loved this man and I think that that's it's really worth remembering that we stand at a very different point in history the things that we're aware of now which are wonderful and so important but they just shouldn't be used to to taint the past or taint our judgment of the past in that way it might make us feel much better about ourselves to judge the past in such a way that we're, we've come so far or we're so much more morally superior but it doesn't really aid in any understanding of of the people of that time what they were thinking and and where we came from you know so yeah i think it's essential to try to kind of imagine yourself back into their time and and get a sense of what they think so a book like this must involve a, a massive amount of historical research like what was the the biggest challenge in that regard i think the biggest challenge is you're writing a book that's not only set in a different country but also in a different you know in such a different time and place so you're you're trying to think back to what life might have been like 100 years ago and how people would have thought and again just in a very practical sense you know you could do research into something for a day and that that might end up as a line in the book you know and every chapter's just got oodles of this kind of stuff where you're you're thinking oh well you know what color would the lights of an ambulance in 19 in Vienna in the 1960s have been you know and you could go down a wormhole of kind of cross-referencing all these things and trying to check that you're being completely historically accurate and I really felt um I really felt that I wanted to be as historically accurate as possible and I think I felt quite constrained by that for a long time whilst writing the novel it was only really when I realized or I allowed myself to remember that this was a work of fiction and yes it's biographical fiction I'm using real facts about real people people who I have a great amount of respect for and also you know I want to tell a great story I wanted this book to be a page turner I wanted it to be something that people were surprised by and I think I I try and keep to the facts as much as possible whilst also presenting them in a way that hopefully is compelling and makes the reader want to keep turning the page. Do you have a blog? No, I don't actually, no. You should write about some of these things like some of the um this this wealth of material that you that you uncovered while you were researching that so that'd make a really interesting blog to promote the book. Yeah, that's really that's a really nice point, actually. Maybe I could do one on my website. Yeah, because there's so much interesting stuff would have come up and how it ties into the story and, you know, all this material that you obviously couldn't use except to to form the background, but it must be so interesting. I'd like to hear more about some of the travels that you did as well. Um, did you travel to all of these towns that he lived in? Did travel to, I spent quite a lot of time in Vienna. I went to the town where he was born. I went to the place, Chesky Krumlov, where his mother was born, which is absolutely beautiful. I mean, I, if anybody's looking for a great uh, trip once things have calmed down, hopefully in the future, Chesky Krumlov or Krumau, as it, as it is now known, is absolutely stunning. It's just this fairy tale town full of kind of cobbled streets and beautiful castles and this fast flowing river that. Um, runs through it it's it's truly magical um I didn't go to Trieste which is the town on the coast where Egon Sheila's parents spent their honeymoon and where Gertrude and Egon run away to um when they get the opportunity so that was one place that I didn't travel to but everywhere else I think it's really important to kind of have the image of the place in your mind to see the studios where uh, Sheila was creating work to see the places where he might have spent an evening or the prison cell where he was incarcerated all these things just to be able to write authentically about them I felt it was really important to to visit these places and, and to kind of get a real sense of place are any of the houses he lived in are they still there and identifiable yeah, they absolutely are. So in Vienna, you can see um, the house where he lived overlooking the um, apartment where Edith and Adele Harms lived. So you oh, can wow. see how uh, close they would have been able to see each other from uh, opposite sides of the street. Unfortunately, you can't go in. You can't go in either of them because they're private residences. Um, but you can visit lots of locations that are associated with, with the artist and the women. 
again, it's much harder to find information directly related to the women. So, for example, where Valley might have lived during her time in Vienna, this kind of stuff just has been lost to history, which is a real shame. But you have to just try and piece together as much of the information as you can and hopefully make it convincing. Was there a period when he lived in Krems as well? Was that a childhood? Yes. Yeah, so he did move to Krems when he he was either expelled from his high school or failed all his exams and, you know, he gets kicked out. So he goes to live in Krems where uh, he boards with a couple of different people so that he can continue his education at a secondary school in Krems. And I think, again, there's lots of lovely drawings and paintings that he made as a young teenager while he's kind of exploring his freedom there. So that must have been uh, quite an influential place for him. I wish I'd known that before. I did. When I read it in your book, I thought, Jesus, I was in, I went to Krems a couple of years ago. Like I was doing a hiking trip in um, Slovakia in the high Tatras and, you know, flights in and out of Vienna. So decided to take a day, um, a couple of days in Krems along the Danube and wander through the wineries uh, there. And the, um, the castle where uh, Richard the Lionheart was imprisoned is, is just down, down the river, down or up. I forget and quite nearby anyway. Um, you can hike to it from Krems and it's just a ruin on the, on the side of a cliff above the river, but that was kind of a, it's a beautiful area. It is. It is. Yeah. It's really, um, that whole part of the world is really stunning. So, uh, it's, and obviously Vienna has changed a great deal since in the, in the hundred years since the first world war and since the Habsburg empire crumbled. And I think as well, talking about this kind of sense of place and, um, the landscapes, you know, thinking about how the maps were redrawn, the whole kind of the whole way that the city felt and looked and how people would have acted there has changed, you know, so so much so much has shifted in a century in terms of landscape and place. And so I think Vienna is a really strong character in the book as well, just to sink into to that kind of atmosphere. Yeah, it really made me want to go back as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you captured it really nicely. So what was the what would you say was the most startling thing or the most surprising thing you uncovered in your research? I think the things that struck me the most and captured my imagination the most was the fact that Adele had died as an older woman, 78, and that she'd had nothing to her name and no children and was penniless. And the fact that she um, was buried in her brother-in-law's grave. And aside from that... I think listening to the interviews that Alessandra Camini had made with Gertrude and Adele was really powerful. I could hear their voices. Um, I couldn't understand what they were saying because it was all in, um, you know, their own language. But it was so incredible to to hear their voices and how they would have sounded. And they they sounded really eccentric <laughs> as old women. They had these very strong accents. So, so there's audio of this. Like, yeah, it's not just a transcript. You could actually listen to this. Yeah, the audio was there. So Alessandra Camini, who um, she was the first person to, in the 60s, kind of follow in Sheila's footsteps. She photographed the cell where he had been imprisoned and she went to all the locations associated with him, which was something that had never been done before. And she gathered and collated all this fantastic information and she tracked down the living uh women who were associated with Sheila, Adele and Gertrude, and she interviewed them and she befriended them. And I just think that's the most magical thing possible to think that, you know, she's still alive and she met these women and it's such a beautiful link to the past that it feels incredibly compelling. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'll try to. Is it online anywhere? Um, or did you have to go to Vienna? I I just emailed Alessandra Camini and asked her, and she's very she's very gracious and very generous, and I think she loves sharing her research. So she might have put it up online somewhere now. So did you come away from this um, with a desire to try modeling yourself for an artist? <laughs> Yeah. Do you know what? So many people have asked me that. And I've got to say, I've got no desire whatsoever to put myself into that position. I I have, as part of my research, I did try and kind of assume some of these poses and that some of them are incredibly convoluted and difficult. And I thought, how long could I really, could I sit like this for an hour with my arm bent around my knee and this kind of, you know, they, he really put them through their paces in terms of, the the contortions that he made 
he made his models uh, undertake. Whilst it would have been a great privilege, I think, to be painted by Egon Schiele, also it's very exposing and <laughs> I'm sure you reveal a great deal about yourself more than perhaps you'd want the world to know. But it's it's funny to think now that these women's images are being shared so widely. You know, whenever I post one on Instagram, I just think they wouldn't have been able to imagine a world in which thousands of people within an hour are liking this this painting of them. Um, you know, I think of Gertrude, Adele, Edith and Valley and just the way the way that people are interacting with their their faces and their stories is just incredible and it's something that could never have been they could never have imagined uh, back in their day so that's that's really interesting and it must have been such excruciating work as well it's just the holding those poses for such a long time much much harder than modeling for a photographer obviously they they really should have this this recognition that you've given them i think <laughs> <laughs> I think the singular benefit was that Sheila worked very quickly. Mm. He uh, he really sketched at speed and he worked at speed. So I think that probably would have um, benefited them greatly and, and saved them pins and needles. So the, the Instagram account is Egon Sheila's Women. I really recommend people sign up to this. It's such a such an enjoyable feed to follow. So did you start this um, after you had already begun work on the book or was the, which came first? Yeah. I think I had the idea for the book and then I realized that I was doing all this research and I couldn't find, you know, really good quality images of the women um, or I was finding them. And then I'd noticed that, you know, there was a kind of gap where they could be posted on Instagram. And I thought, oh, people, I love I love seeing these and I love hearing these stories. So I'm sure other people would like to um, hear about them as well. And it's it's such a great community. It's got artists there's celebrities in there some a-list Hollywood actors who are massive Egon Schiele fans who occasionally you get a dm saying oh I love this painting and it's just this really incredible space in which I'm hearing from people all around the world you get some incredible stories some really brilliant insights it just feels like such a privilege to have that kind of um, community around everybody interested in in this artist and the women who modeled for him. I really recommend if especially anybody who doesn't know his work, who's listening to this, uh, go and check out the Instagram feed. You'll be mesmerized and you'll, you'll really get a sense of why this, um, this artist was uh, so vital and still so, so relevant today, such a, an incredible body of work. I, I guess maybe it's early too early to ask, but what's next for you? Will you, would you consider another historical novel? Yes, it's not too early to ask. I'm I'm in the throes of book number two. So I got a two book deal, which is a real privilege. Um, and they very much wanted uh, the same again, an artist and an artist story shining light on the women who, who modeled for him. So I am almost at the first at the end of the first draft of that it is a household name one that people will have heard of but also I I the stories of these women have never been told before so I'm really excited to um tell them for the first time in the same way that I've shared Sheila's uh women's stories cool I well, look forward to that and if, if you're looking for another project after that one uh, Die Brücke the German expressionists i would love to see uh, to learn more about the the models that they that post for them oh really um, when they i think when they the period when they were in berlin they used the same small set of models quite frequently in their in their studio and all these all these different artists painted them in in various ways that that would be a really interesting story I'll check that out. yeah thank you all right well thank you thank you very much sophie for your time that's really interesting and i really enjoyed the book and, and recommend it highly Oh, thank you so much. It's such a privilege just to speak to people like you, to get your insights, to be part of this podcast. I'm I'm absolutely delighted. So thank you so much for that. All right. Good luck. Good luck with the next one. Thank you so much. I'll keep in touch. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Personal Landscapes. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes and subscribe through your favorite app. You can find links to today's podcast and more conversations on Books About Place at ryanmurdoch.com. You'll also find a donate button if you'd like to contribute to the costs of the show. All donations are greatly appreciated.